Good morning, Northwood. You know, when we uh, made an observation on how Jesus uh, began his preaching, and then you look at the, one of the last teachings of Jesus Christ during the days he was on earth, you will see this focus right here. And that is when he first began preaching, he said that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And after his resurrection, he spent 40 more days with his disciples. He taught them and he spoke of things concerning the kingdom of God. So you see that the kingdom of God is the major focus of, of Jesus' teaching. And last week, Pastor Bob Roberts clearly explained to us when we receive Jesus Christ, we enter his kingdom. And the kingdom of God is a way of living in community life. This concept of common life in the society was not a new idea to me because I was born and I grew up in Vietnam, uh, one of the last four communist countries in the world besides China, Cuba, and North Korea. So what I have learned between these two kingdoms, if I may put that way, the major difference between the communist countries and the kingdom of God is this. The communist leaders attempt to create such lifestyle, the community life, uh, lifestyle, with their personal, their ambition effort, human effort. On the other hand, the Christians are given the kingdom by King Jesus Christ, by the messianic Jesus Christ. Put simply, communists attempted to build a kingdom without a king. Christians are given the kingdom by Jesus Christ. Can we say amen to that? So you are entering the kingdom of God by Jesus Christ. And the key that I have learned is that union with God through Jesus Christ is the only basis, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, it, it's the only basis of human social union. Through Jesus, we have human social union. A great philosopher from the East said that, trực diện giao thiên, bình diện giao nhân. Chad, did you get that? It means that, it means that only through union with God, men can have peaceful union with one another. So today, we will look at the summary of chapter 4 in the book of Acts. Would you please open your Bible with me? We will look at the reality of the kingdom of God being lived out by, by the early Christian community. This is very important for, for all of us who are seeking to understand what it means to live in the community of faith in Jesus Christ. We will look at verses 32 to 35, the book of Acts, and let's read the Word of God together. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him was his own. But all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were given testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and the abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of the land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. When we observe these two summaries of chapter 4 and chapter 2, you will see that these two summaries are almost the same, if not identical. Luke gave us the picture that the early Christians, they characterized the community life as marked by four things at least. And that is their unity, one in heart and mind. Secondly, the sharing of their possession. Third, the power and the witness of the apostles. And fourth, the abundant grace of God rested upon them all. And all of these are the result are the results of being filled and baptized by the Holy Spirit. And that is the key. That is the key. When you are baptized by the Holy Spirit, you will experience all of these results. And my theme for this morning is awaken to generosity. 
awakened to generosity. We are going to examine and learn the motives of their generosity. And of course, the purpose and the main business of, of their generosity is for the witness of Jesus Christ. Okay. So if you could look with me, verse 32. The congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Point number one, they shared because they were united in Jesus Christ. This is the most extraordinary picture of the church unity. If you remember Jesus Christ in John 17, he prayed with all his heart, Father, may they be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. For all the years I've been learning and researching, and I looked at this passage, I said, got it. I found it. Like, like you know, a communist, Eureka, I have found it. This is the most beautiful picture of complete unity of what it's like for us to live out the kingdom of God. And I'd like to confess with you something that really when I first read this passage, one in heart and one in mind, this is almost impossible for me to believe at first. Not that I lacked a faith, but this is faith seeking understanding. Now imagine with me, when we have a group of 12, it's already a difficult challenge to unite them together. Would you agree? Remember when Jesus was with them and he was praying and what were they debating about? So oh, who is number one when he's gone? You remember that uh, conversation? A couple of times, Jesus had to turn to them and said, hey guys, hey, hey. He picked up a child and he said, hey, if you want to be number one, be like this child. Want to be the greatest? Be the smallest among you all. So this is difficult for me to understand. We are not talking about the 12. We're talking about not just hundreds, but this is 3,000. No, no, it's 5,000 and beyond. So having them without Jesus, it, it's beyond my understanding. Would you agree? If you're not, just turn to your spouse or your buddy and say that when was the last time we were one in heart and mind? Could you do that? And then if the answer were yes, we'll ask how long did we stay like that? If I study correctly, I mean the divorce rate among the society is huge and in the church as well. So I see, my, my point is this, my point is this, if it's not by the power of God through His Holy Spirit, this is mission impossible. Agree? This is mission impossible. So I did some study. The fact that when Luke said it, I, when Luke, you know, he recorded this picture, I asked Luke through the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, did Brother Luke, Dr. Luke, exaggerate a little bit? You know, can, can I say that? You know, could you, could you imagine with me 5,000 united in one heart and mind? There has to be something very special. And the fact that Luke did not drop dead, because if you lied to the Holy Spirit, you would drop dead, like Ananias, the next chapter. So the fact that Luke did not drop dead, I got to study. What's going on here? I studied the phrase one heart and one mind. It echoes the Jewish heart theology. And that is, you look with me in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, when Moses told the people one thing before they enter the promised land. And that is, hear all Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your spirit. So the key is right there. You see with me, this is the key in both passages, the book of Acts and Deuteronomy. The key word is one. The Hebrew text, the language is echad. And did you know that Paul, many times, he really confirmed his theology, and that is God is one. But this word echad right here expresses to me, to my understanding, this is one of the most beautiful Important words that we learn from the scriptures. The word echad, it is used 500 times in the Old Testament. And I did a study that I read all of those references in Hebrew language, and it's just a fun thing. But here's the key. Here's the key. Here's the key. Remember that this word right here reveals the personality of God. It reveals the presence of God. It reveals the power of God. It reveals the purpose and the plan for all humanity. The word echad 
And I studied, there are many references, but there is one that I could not ignore this morning. Look with me in Zechariah 19.4. Sorry, Zechariah 14.9. The text says that, if I may quote in just Hebrew for the sake of my joy in speaking Hebrew, amen? I memorize it, okay? Here's it. Here, here it is. Yihya Yahweh Echad Ushmu Echad. There shall be one Lord, His name is one. There it is. God is one. His name is one in the Hebrew translation, which means when you speak of the names of someone in the Bible, it reveals the characters of who God is. So I can see that my assumption and my understanding is right here. The people in the early century, their characters were deeply transformed into the character of who God is. And who is God? He is a giving God. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. So that is the key right there. They gave because they were united in the character of who God is. And that's why they fulfill the second part of the great commandment, and that is, love thy neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. So that's my point number one. Look with me, point number two. The second part of of, 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 of verse 32, you will see that no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. They shared because, because they were owned by Jesus Christ. Now, this is a higher degree of Emmanuel, not just God with us, but God in us, God through us. God is all over us. Our lives are no longer our own. We are owned by Jesus. And the apostle Paul many times said that, guys, guys, don't forget, we are bought with a huge prize of Jesus Christ. He bought us with a huge prize. Live and demonstrate the life of Jesus Christ. Luke's description in this picture right here, I am sure that he would have evoked an immediate response from the people living in the first century, and even now, when I read this, I got really surprised. But did you know that the Greeks, the Greeks shared a common myth that in primitive times, the people lived in an ideal state which there was no ownership, but everything, everything was held in common. Great philosophers like Pythagoras and Plato, they envision an ideal republic as one devoid of all private ownership. There it is. The early Christian community lived out this picture. It is the dream, the dream vision. They really lived in the golden age of what the ancients dreamed to have. Christianity is the dispensation of the feeling and the flowing of the Holy Spirit. Without the feeling, the anointing, and the flowing of the Holy Spirit, it is impossible. It's mission impossible if you, de if, 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 if you attempt to unite two people together. At Northwood, we, we practice tea life cell. And the only major key that could happen to Northwood is because we are filled by the Holy Spirit. Not in an arrogant way, but in a humble way that the key is not just for Northwood, but for anywhere else. It's up and down with being filled by the Holy Spirit. Amen? And I've heard some of you all share that it's hard, but yes, the key is right there. Have you been baptized by the Holy Spirit? Many studies about the theology of the body of Christ. Paul later expresses that such community life in Jesus Christ is called the body life, whose head is Jesus Christ. And what is, what is the body life? Who came up with that brilliant idea? Some scholars agree that it is Paul who, who really developed that theology of the body of Christ. And how did Paul come up with, with that idea? Some people believe that this is how he came up with that idea. Biblically, one time he walked into the church of Gentiles and some Jews, and that was the event for a huge fellowship. He was expecting some well manners of behaviors. He walked in, and one group he saw people were eating something that really set for the whole congregation. 
So one group came early, and they ate most of the yummy food. The other group came later, hungry, expecting something you know good, but there's nothing much left over. Some people came late, some came early, so it was a huge chaotic picture. And Paul saw that. He said, "Guys, guys, this, this is me." Okay, Paul came in and said, "Guys, hey, hey, time out, time out. Don't you have homes to eat?" Shouldn't you eat at home if you are that hungry? I mean, we have the poor among us. Can you behave in, in a good manner of Jesus Christ? So Paul, he saw that picture. He said, "Guys, guys, listen to me. We are parts of Jesus' body." He picked up the bread and said, "This is His body, broken for all of us. When you eat this, wait for one another. You are the body of Christ." Behave. He picked up the juice and said, "This is his blood for our new covenant. When you eat this, you drink this, you remember of Jesus Christ and proclaim his resurrection until he comes. So remember the order in the church and the unity." And that's how people believe that. Yeah, Paul developed the concept of the body life based on the nature of who God is. God is one. The oneness of the many, the oneness of the many, to reflect the character of who God is. Look with me, verse thirty-four and thirty-five, as we move into point number three. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be. They would be distributed to each as any had need. They shared because they recognized the needs among them. Verse thirty-four reminds us, or sets forth, the Old Testament ideal when God told His people in in Deuteronomy chapter fourteen, verse four forward, that guys follow my command, so that among you there will be no needy persons. That's the ideal found in the Old Testament scriptures, teaching from the teaching from Moses pass on to the people. You see right here, Luke is presenting the early Christian community as as the ideal people group who fulfilled who fulfilled the teaching of God in the Old Testament, so that there would be no poor people among them. Last time I checked on the poverty of of the world today. The percentage is hard to look at. More than fifty percent, more than fifty percent, more than that, living in poverty. And does the church have needs? Yes, we have needs. The true needs are to fulfill the great commission and the great commandment. And that's why we are challenging you all to stay alert and to be awakened to generosity spirit. It is flowing from the Holy Spirit, and we have to recognize the moment. A couple of nights ago, when I looked at this passage and meditating, and I just realized something, and I woke up in the middle of the night and I just wrote down what I just felt from my heart, from from His Spirit, and that is: imagine a group of twelve now turned into one hundred and twenty, and then boom, overnight three thousand, and then the next time you learn. Five thousand at least. So the needs would be really huge for the community, and I'm sure, I am sure the apostles would address these needs really hard. Not hard, but yeah, that's why the text says right there: the needs are there, the needs are there. Not to mention, not to mention that there in this great multitude, five thousand at least, there were different backgrounds. They all come from different backgrounds and different education levels and social status as well. The apostles themselves are an example. John and Peter are regarded as the、um, not a higher education, but their teaching and persuasions are spirit inspired rather than teach and learn. So you see right there, there were poor people among this great multitude, just like us today. When we are living in our society, 
Another issue that I need to point out by the grace of God as I study this passage, and that is the issue of housing and hospitality. Ask yourself these questions. Where could they meet? They meet at home, of course, but there must be big houses so they can hold like more than 20 or 30 or hundreds. So that's a key right there. The early church was dependent on the hospitality and the houses of the members who were more well-to-do believers because the purpose to provide a venue, a, a venue is key to, to retain the Word of God and to pass on the Word of God. There are needs to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. Financial needs are always a constant challenge, and we all understand that. It takes sacrificial giving. When we study the biggest church on the planet, Pastor Cho, uh, Pastor Yonggi Cho and his mother-in-law, Pastor Jia Xiu, it says that the church now runs about 830 thousand members, almost a million, 830,000 members. And the story behind how the church took off is this, is this story right here. As I studied and, 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 and learned about uh, the church, Yo, uh, Yodo, the full gospel church, that first they met together at home. Pastor Chong Cho and, and his mother-in-law met together at home. And then a couple of weeks later, 50 people showed up, and months later turned into hundreds, and then five years, five, 10,000 in the early 70s. And then when the church is, it was in need of a bigger place to hold them and to spread the gospel, Pastor Jong Yi Cho was called by God to build a bigger place. So he and his wife sold their house. Really? His wife thought that Pastor Joe was out of his mind, but then they both listened to the Holy Spirit. He sold his house. A lot of people followed him. When the building was in the campaign to get the church built, you remember the economic problem hit in early 70s, and then the oil shock broke out. Many people lost their jobs. And the current of the, you know, dollar currency dropped its value. The church suddenly found itself bankrupt. There was one winter worship service. Pastor Yong Yi Cho could barely finish his term because he was totally depressed. He thought that the vision was a myth. It's just human effort. It's now gone because the church was in debt, in, in big, huge debt. After his sermon, there was an elderly lady walked from the aisle up to Pastor Cho, uh, Cho, Yong Yi Cho and said, Pastor, may I, may I offer what I have from my heart? And that is a bowl that she uses. She used to eat rice and a pair of her chopsticks. She was in tears and said, that, Pastor, this is all I had. I just felt deeply by the Holy Spirit that I would just like to offer this to the needs of the church. Pastor Yong Yi Cho was in tears because he was touched by that courageous, you know, faith of the lady. And he said, ma'am, how could I receive this? This is all you have. The lady was in tears and said, how could God turn down an offering of an elderly lady? This is my heart. At that moment right there, a businessman, a businessman stood up and said, Pastor, would you please allow me to buy that bowl and that pair of chopsticks with $20,000 I have in my bank? All the businessmen stood up and said, I will do the same. Can I invest in that bowl and that pair of chopsticks? Some people said, they stood up and they said that I just lost my job, but I will commit to give my salary for the whole year, just for the needs of the church. Some lady stood up in tears and said that I don't have a job, but I have my hair. I'm going to cut my hair for the sake of the kingdom of God. Pastor Jong Yu Cho, in his own words, saying that God worked miracles just within that year 1973. The economy was brought back on feet, and jobs were provided, and the church was built within that year. Brothers and sisters, 
It's always take sacrificial offering. To be filled by the Holy Spirit is to be real and to live your challenge nightmare so that you can understand who God is. When we have faith, please do not think that you will always walk on the sunny days. When you have faith, God will bring you to the wilderness. When there is no more water, then you will know who God is. When we have faith, the Lord will take you from one place to another that you will know Him more. That's why we can be filled by the Holy Spirit to understand the power of God. Look with me in the last two verses of chapter 4, the book of Acts. You will see something very significant between biblical giving and religious giving through two pictures of two men, Barnabas and Ananias. These two men, they gave, they gave to the church. We see right here that they both sold property. Both brought the proceeds of their sales to the apostles. And both committed it to their disposal. But the difference is this, that Barnabas gave all what he committed. Ananias, he committed this, but when he gave, he kept back. Nothing wrong. We applaud the giving heart of Ananias, but this is the important thing. He lied. He said it's all, but really he kept back. The language reminds us in the Old Testament when Achan, he stole from what he found. The property belonged to God. The key is dishonesty and deceit, deception. He lied to the Holy Spirit. Biblical giving is you give voluntarily without any recognition or reputation. Amen? You believe that you are given not just to, not to the apostles, but you are given to Jesus Christ. That's the key right there. And Ananias, just imagine if, if he got away with that. The power of God would not spread powerful as it did in the first century. So you have right here in my, in my conclusion for the series, the sermon this morning, Awaken to Generosity, where we learn from this passage the ultimate key is to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Do you have that desire? Seek Him. God is answering you all. He desires to baptize His followers. And once you are baptized by His, by His Spirit, then we will experience that we give because we are united by Jesus. When you are baptized by the Holy Spirit, you will recognize the needs to give. And our lives are owned by Jesus Christ. As I prepared for this sermon, I stumbled into what John Piper wrote in his book, Desiring God, which expresses beautifully what, what, what His grace and mercy allowed me to present to you. And this is the key right here. Here is my conclusion from John Piper. If love is the overflow of joy in God that gladly meets the needs of other people, and if God loves such joyful givers, then this joy in giving is a Christian duty, and the effort not to pursue it is sin. There are great joys in giving and sharing to bring the name of God bring the name of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth to meet the needs, to fulfill the great commission and the great commandment. Would you stand with me, brothers and sisters and friends and families? This morning, among you, are there any needs that you know the church can help? Don't hesitate. Come. Seek God through the body of Christ. Partner, prayer partners, would you please come forward? The Bible says that among you there shall be no more needy people. Among you, if you have needs, come forward. Together, let's pray. We trust and believe that the Holy Spirit is touching this place. Ask, it shall be given. And among you who have acknowledged that God 
has blessed you in many ways. And the needs are there for Northwood to continue bring his name to the ends of the earth from Keller, Hartum City, to Mexico, to Vietnam, and beyond. May it be Barnabas among us.